I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah All right, I guess we're fun. live. <laughs> Everybody. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome to Do Us First Remote Work Live Chat. Uh, I'm Chase, and this is Brenna. And today we're going to just talk a little bit about remote work. Um, there's a ton of chatter out there about remote work, and uh, suddenly tons of people who are like just throwing ideas out there and theories about how to make remote work work. And I guess we've been talking a lot about it, like Brenna and I and our teams, kind of like how to cut through that chatter and just sort of like share what we know. I mean, our, we're a company that's been remote since the beginning for the last 10 years. Between Brenna and I, we have almost 20 years, I think, of yeah. remote work experience. And so we were just thinking like, what would be a, a fun way to interact with our uh, with our users and just talk about the real issues that are coming to their mind that we're hearing from them through our different social channels and, and all that. So we, uh, we thought we'd give this a shot. So hopefully, um, hopefully you guys think it's fun and enjoy it. And uh, we'll be able to answer some questions uh, that you have. Um, we've got a couple talking points, a few questions that came in ahead of time that we'll get to. And then uh, also some live questions coming in. So um, I think one of the most interesting points about this, Bern and I were talking like right beforehand, is like, you know, this is kind of unusual times for everybody. I mean, we've both been working remote a long time, but like I, for instance, I'm in Spain and I'm under full quarantine now for over two weeks, <laughs> unable to leave my house and go work for my co-working where I normally go. Bruno's situation is probably even a little bit more stressful. And I think it's a good, like, clear segue to, to dive right into this, like, because this is the question I probably hear more than anything else is like, Bruno, you're, you're working from home with a toddler at home and yeah. Francisco, too. Yeah. So um, normally I, my daughter, who is three and a half years old, she is in preschool. Um, which she's clearly not right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, and my husband is also working at home. So usually I have this like perfect, pristine, quiet, um, you know, eight hour chunk where I can work. And now, you know, we're having to kind of divide up the day and we're basically both working half days, which feels incredibly inefficient. Um, but I guess, you know, that's the name of the game and we're not the only ones on the planet dealing with this. So I guess there's some solace in the fact that we're not alone. But um, yeah, I guess um, for people who are working from home with kids, like this is definitely <laughs> not the norm, especially if you're having to play like teacher and work. And, you know, if you have multiple kids, God save your soul. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess some things that have helped us out during this time are like being extra mindful about communicating your schedule and your needs with um, your partner or whoever is helping you out with your kid. Like um, just reiterating, like I have a meeting at 10 a.m. or, you know, I need to work for two hours this afternoon and just being really clear about communicating with them. Um, my husband and I have a shared Google calendar, uh, where we put in all of our meetings every day and we try and plan each day. So that has been helpful so that we can see like who's working when and who's taking care of our daughter when, um, can I ask Rena is, is his, is his, uh, like schedule similar to yours and that like, does he have flexibility? I mean, I know he works for yeah. like a bigger company, so is it yeah. similar where he can, make his day malleable or? Yeah, he works at Philips, um, like the electronics company. Um, and they have always been really forward thinking in terms of like flexibility at work. So he is able to um, make his own schedule, but he does tend to have a ton of meetings and at strange hours with people in Japan and Russia and stuff. Um, so it is tricky finding a balance. Um, one thing though, that my favorite tip, which I'm going to tell everybody, um, like if you have kids, you probably already have a white noise app. And I know Chase, like I have told you a million times about my white noise app because I like can't yes. know how useful it is. Um, I'm addicted so now, now too. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I. I have I do a lot of writing for work because like I'm the head of marketing and do it. So I do a lot of writing and I have a hard time concentrating if there's noise in the background. So 
I just put in my AirPods and turn on like oscillating fan uh, just so that I can't hear them in the background. And that has made like a world for difference for um, like helping me concentrate at work. So ugh, hang in there people, this is not easy. This is not normal. Um, yeah, it's really hard. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's good for everybody to know that too. That like even for companies like us that are fully remote and everybody's used to dealing with time zone issues and and you know making your own schedule and working from home sometimes with kids sometimes without like we're all living in different circumstances now and so everybody's got to kind of be extra empathetic to their teammates and and voice that it's okay to you know operate a little bit differently under the circumstances and. I think we've been good about that so far at, at Doist, and hopefully, you know, other companies are too. Um, got another question that just came in. So, what's what's one thing you wish someone told you before you started working remotely? Um, yeah, I have a I, response if you want to think about it, but you go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I really wish someone would have told me like I've I've pretty much just worked remote um, my entire career. Like when I first started, I had to go into an office one day a week, um, but otherwise I was always working from home or on the road or whatever. And I just wish someone would have told me like, "Hey, take some time to like actually be intentional about your remote work setup. You know, physically like where you work. You know, set aside some space in your home, a particular place that you can go to and." more importantly, leave at the end of the day. And then also like setting boundaries with roommates or, or significant others or, or um, you know, kids, whoever it is in your house. Also setting some like boundaries about, hey, I'm, when I'm home, that doesn't mean I'm available. I need time to focus on work. And uh, if I had just done that from the beginning, I know that I would have been much more productive rather than like spending like six years figuring that out and then realizing, actually, I think I'm best if I just go to a co-working. <laughs> uh, but being intentional about it from the beginning would have made so much more of a difference. And like, um, I know that now, but nobody coached me on that yeah. in the beginning. It's funny. It's so funny that you mentioned that about like being intentional about your physical space, because kind of the first thing that came to my mind was like being more intentional about actually how you get your work done so i guess yeah the first step would be like setting up your space and figuring out how you're actually gonna do this with in your environment or finding the right environment for you but um like if somebody would have told me at the very beginning like be intentional about the way you work and the way you try and be productive I feel like that would have been super helpful and I think this is also like I've been thinking about this because of um a lot of the content that we post on our blog is um very productivity related mm -hmm. um so we've been kind of like digging deeper into these productivity methods um and if I had had that information or like been more thoughtful about searching for that information before I started working remotely, like I probably could have been a lot more productive in those beginning years. Um, I feel like it's taken me 10 years to figure out a system that yeah. worked well for me. And um, that has been completely thrown out the window. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, as soon as you figure it out, then a world crisis uh, comes yeah. in. And <laughs> says, Thanks for your plan, yeah. yeah. Normally though, uh, like I feel like I have, um, you know, in uh, my like perfect little work at home bubble without coronavirus. Like uh, I, I had like a pretty meticulous um, way that I planned my days and the tasks that I needed to do and stuff. So I guess Ooh, that would you good. share. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got inspired by one of our um, blog posts on the Doist blog about um, time blocking um, and I had never done that before. And I tend to, I don't multitask, but like I used to bounce around a lot between different tasks and it's hard to do that context switching, especially for us, yeah. like multiple apps and, you know, multiple brands. And so I was just feeling like so harried during the day. So I read this blog post about time blocking. Um, and so I write out my schedule at the end of every day. I 
I take a look, I have a, a to do list filter for like work tasks for tomorrow. So I mm. look at that and I look at the, that filter and see all of the things that I need to complete tomorrow. And then I write down in a, in a notebook, like from, you know, nine to five um, and break things down um, by hour basically. And, and I try really hard to stick to that schedule. It's not That's cool. You actually like write. So you actually write it out in in uh, like with pen and paper. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, we have. All right. Uh, <laughs> next question: Do you have any tips on ways to psychologically bookend the day and give closure, both as individuals and teams, when flexibility means people may want to work at offset times? It's a good question. Bookend the day. Yeah, I, I do. I definitely do book in my day. And this is something I just recently started doing, I would say. I mean, this is like, again, like coming back to it being such a learning curve over the course of many, many years to figure out how to make remote work work well. Um, this is something I probably just started doing in the last year. But I actually will like physically put something on my calendar for the end of the day that separates work from personal life. So like it could be like, take the dog on a walk or meet a friend or do a class online. Like a per, like I'm studying Spanish because I'm living in Spain. So maybe it's a 30 minute Spanish lesson, but something to separate the two. And since it's on my calendar, it also goes on my Todoist and then I can just like check it off. It's like my last task of the day. And yeah. that, that has really helped me like separate those two. And then I can like get up and leave my workspace. Right. I feel like it's helpful also when you work from a co-working space, um, which I know you normally do. Um, yeah. Like I guess you actually have to leave, but when you're working from home as you are right now, it's it can be really hard to find the stopping point, especially like if you work in a company whose culture is like, you know, people are sending you messages all the time and people like expect you to respond you know, at strange hours of the day, like uh, do us, we're really good about um, giving our team members a, a work life balance and, you know, working yeah. eight hours and then disconnecting and finding that disconnecting point is important. Um, like for me personally, the way I was, um, what I was talking about before about time blocking my schedule, um, every day I, Normally, uh, again, this is like a normal circumstance. <laughs> not as ever, it's a hot mess. Um, There's two different time periods. We're talking yeah. about like reality and like today's reality. Yeah. So normal times, like <laughs> I would set aside like from four to four thirty every day. I would set aside like um, half an hour to do um, in, like to try and get to inbox zero um, on email and in twist. Um, and that was kind of like my way to try and close out the day and make sure all my tasks were completed. And if they weren't, um, you know, send them over to the next day. Um, but I like your method of, you know, adding something to your calendar or going somewhere or doing a class. Yeah, that's, um, that's worked well for me. But... Zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that's, it's interesting how like different systems would work different for everybody because like, if I had email as the last thing on my list, like I would, I have, I probably work in email more than you yeah. do, but like that would stress me out because <laughs> it would just be growing throughout the day. And then I would be like, Oh no. So I have one task set for hit inbox zero once a day. And I, well, as soon as I hit it, like at some point in midday, I, I close out email and I don't go back to the next day. And that keeps me from breaking my rule at the end of the day. But that was, again, like, I had to learn to do that. Otherwise, I'd be answering emails all night. I mean, yeah. Nobody wants to. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so as a manager, how often should I check in with remote employees without micromanaging? Ooh, you probably have. Yeah, I have, I have thoughts about this. <laughs> uh, and I only have, like, extra thoughts about this because I wrote, like, a 5,000-word blog post for our, our blog about um, trust in a remote workspace. So if anybody wants to read about um, how we try and cultivate a high-trust culture at Duist, you can check out our blog, um, duist.com slash blog, and you can just um, search the word trust and it will, it will show up. Um, it's a really good one. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, it's a great question because I feel like 
there's a lot that you have to tackle before like this particular question of like checking in with roommates. Like, um, I think if it, it depends a lot on what your company culture is like, right? So if you already have like a more trustworthy culture, then you probably don't feel the need to like check in as often. But if you don't have a high trust culture, then you're probably going to be feeling a lot of anxiety in this remote workplace if you're doing it for the first time and feeling like, oh my God, like I can't see what people are doing. Like, I don't know if they're online. And um, I guess this is something that we at Duis have been working on for, you know, the last 10 years. Like we have always been fully remote um, and we have always tried really hard to hire people who are self-starters. So like I said, like there's just so much like go that needs to happen like before that <laughs> this, you know, concept of checking in because um, like you need to give people, uh, you know, the space and autonomy to, to work on their own. And, you know, it, it also like depends so much on the individual. There's some people who need more um, interaction and some people who are just very independent and don't need, um, you know, as much, not, not handholding, but like feedback and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say find an appropriate cadence that works for the employee. So if you know somebody, you know, is working on maybe on an especially big project that they might need help with, like, you know, once or twice a week, maybe say like, how are you doing? You know, how can I help you? Um, at Duis, like we only have um, monthly one-on-ones with our teammates. Um, and then we have a monthly all hands meeting with like the marketing and the business teams. Um, we've just set ourselves up that like people are super autonomous um, and don't need a lot of handholding, which you shouldn't in a remote environment. Like people who can't get their work done by themselves without being like pushed and prodded. Like that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more remote um, that's, that's part of the dichotomy though, right now. Right. Though, because a lot yeah. of people like we're screening for that at, at a remote first company, we're screening for like that self starter. And it right now, like I've talked to so many teams over the last couple of weeks that are now suddenly working remotely. And they're like, they, you know, they weren't screened for that. They're, they're in office employees. I think this is where a lot of people that are like genuinely looking for help. Like, I mean, I, I talked to one team in particular that I'm thinking of last week. That was like, like, we literally don't know how to do this because they meet face to face, like multiple times a day. They're always like within two feet of each other, just ready to, you know, ready to interact and support each other. And so to recreate that in a remote environment is like not really doable like from a productivity standpoint or from just like a micro like it becomes very micromanagey to be like hey i need to ping you to to jump into a meeting real quick to basically see what you're doing so i think like some advice i would give maybe not exactly answering this particular question but um something related to it would be like don't try to recreate the office setting in a remote environment like if you're just suddenly transitioning to this i wouldn't suggest like trying to replicate everything that you do back in the office. And then also don't think that like, you know, all of a sudden you need to be more on the, along the lines of micromanaging because some people will actually flourish in this environment. You'll see their productivity skyrocket. So don't go into it with these like preconceived notions that you need to be one way or the other. You probably have to look at each individual, see who's more better suited for this type of work and those who aren't. And, and kind of come up with a system for each one. And, and that, that's going to be a little bit painful at first, um, but but it's, I think, a necessary step to take probably. Yeah, that's great advice, Chase. Um, it's hard, and especially like now you have the added um, factor of like checking in on people's mental health too. So you don't want to just approach stuff from like a work only yeah, perspective. Yeah, totally. Um, I would say like check in to see just how people are doing and then maybe that conversation can evolve into like if they need help with work. But, you know, I think 
in, in a remote setting, like it's very obvious when people aren't doing it. <laughs> so just look out for that and you should be fine, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I I always tell like new remote team leaders, yeah. like just continue to focus on outputs. Don't don't start looking at the the little inputs, the hours worked or the emails sent or the hours that they're chatting or whatever like throw, don't don't do that as a way of managing no. people because that is micromanaging focus on what they produce and the rest take care of, takes care of itself i think you need to put that on a t-shirt or something <laughs> <laughs> done <laughs> that's how i'll make my millions <laughs> um next question we got uh okay how can our team create a strong co company culture remotely uh, we both feel strongly about this one. <laughs> yeah, I love this question. Um, I, and I love this especially because I feel like we have really seen this firsthand. Um, I have been working with Amir for like, I've known him for more than 10. Amir is our, our founder and CEO and um, I've known him for more than 10 years and like, um, I've always been so inspired by him as a leader because I feel like he has such a clear vision of what he wants our company to be. Um, we have a list of core values um, that we've had since the very beginning um, and they haven't really changed at all. And we basically try and embed this list of core values into everything that we do. I mean, anything from like the questions that you ask during an interview process or like the way that we have set up our project management system, our HR policies, et cetera. Um, so I would say like be super intentional about um, deciding what kind of culture that you want to have in the first place. And actually like something as simple as writing it down <laughs> on paper or in a, in, in a document and just being like, totally unapologetic about being a broken record. Like you have to repeat that stuff, um, these core values as frequently as possible and just like ingrain that into people's mm -hmm. brains so that they know what this culture is supposed to be like. Um, I, I absolutely yeah. love one of the things like piggybacking off of that because I would just, if I was going to answer this question, I would have uh, probably not said it as eloquently, but something right along those lines. Um, but the thing I love is that we have this phrase, if it's not a hell yeah, it's a no. And we do that with everything related to these core values. So like if, if something, anything that we're thinking of doing, whether that's hiring a person or doing a promotion or building a new feature, if it's, if it's not very, very closely tied to our core values and we can't say hell yeah, it's tied to the core values, then it's just a no. And it's easy just to move on. And that really helps us maintain that that strong culture, I think. Yeah, and trusting your gut too. Like I feel like um, you know, once you once you've been with a company for a while or once you know the kind of culture that you want to create inside your team, um, you know, being really mindful about the decisions that you make and you know making decisions like using this like hell yeah uh <laughs> methodology like in everything i mean yeah um it's really applicable everywhere so. yeah yeah I and i would say just like and one last point on that on that last question is because of the remote aspect to to it like um you know try, try to remember to have some fun in in a remote work setting it's very easy to get caught up in like just i mean just chatting isn't really just it, it's it's very easy to let the personal relationships break down. It's important to set aside some time for fun virtual meetings, um, have topics of conversation that are not connected to work, uh, anything like that that you can do, like whether it be asynchronously, like in your your communication tool, or if you can set aside, you know, meetings once a month, once every two weeks or something to just get everybody together and have a little fun, um, share what's going on. You know, if you're having a video meeting and somebody's kid comes running in or the dog comes in or something like share that and embrace it and, and have fun with it because that's how people connect in a real way. And it shouldn't be any different in a, in a remote environment. Yeah. I, I feel like we could do a whole show about this. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Just, yeah. Tune in next week. Right. <laughs> 
Um, okay, I don't, we're, we were going to try to keep this to around 30 minutes, so we've uh, we've got about five minutes left. We'll answer another question or two and um, then have a few things to close with. So do you have advice on remote communication and the best way to handle meetings? Yeah, meetings are like such a big thing, especially for people newly moving to remote, I think, yeah, because I they're used to relying on it as like a cornerstone of the communication stack. And for us, it's like so... That, that stack is inverted. We, we don't do meetings very often. It's crazy. I was talking to my neighbor the other day and she was saying that she <clears> had <throat> six and a half hours of Zoom meetings. I'm like, this is not what remote work is going to be like. And she's like, yeah, they wanna, they, they're like keeping us in meetings so that they like know that we're working. And I'm like, <laughs> you're not working though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think this question has like, a, you know, obviously two different parts, remote communication. That's a beast in itself. So I will just kind of touch on the, the meeting part, I guess. Um, I think it's really important uh, to like come prepared, obviously, to a meeting. Um, and it, it depends on how often you meet or what the meeting is about, obviously. But like, for example, if I'm preparing for a monthly one on one with one of my team members, like, we have a feature in our team communication tool called Twist, uh, where I can go in and search like any kind of threads um, or you know discussions that this person has been a part of, and I can kind of like lurk around and see what they've been working on and bring up any points um, that I may want to discuss with them. Um, and then we put all this together inside a to do us project. And I think they're all mostly structured the same, which is like things to talk about. And then we have, you know, a different section, which is um, action points that come out of the interview. Um, so I would definitely say try and come prepared, especially if you're not seeing each other as often as, as you used to. And kind of like what you said before, Chase, um, don't just talk about work like um, not a good idea just to you know especially now like just jump in and you know what's the status on this 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 like what have you been doing every day <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, that's a surefire way to like uh kind of burn some bridges slowly yeah <laughs> you um, alienate teammates like nobody yeah. wants to meet with you because you're just all about work <laughs> yeah especially now like, it's, it's so important to like hear how people are dealing with all the additional stress that is that's happening. Um, but I feel like you, you tend to have more meetings usually than I do. I'm curious to hear what your perspective on this is. Yeah. I mean, some very like tangible, practical advice is like, uh, just like to like a couple tools that I use. I mean, I do, I, I host a lot of meetings. So in my role in business development, I'm meeting with all of our third parties and anybody that like is kind of external of doist, which often involves, some kind of meeting. So I use, I rely on tools like Doodle and Calendly and Boomerang a lot um, for these sorts of things to like get people on the same page and, um, you know, just find times that work for, for everybody involved, especially when there's multiple parties involved. Um, and then, like you said, I mean, I always come prepared with an agenda, um, usually prepared in Todoist and have action points to take away. I try to do like very defined times. Like I make it clear that my, like, you know, I, I tend to think meeting is not working. So I'm very, I kind of go very far with that. And I've even had some people like on other, from other companies say like, wow, you guys really, like I've read that in your blog, but you guys really do take that seriously. And um, so I try to schedule things for like, you know, 15 to 25 minutes, like some odd times that kind of signal like, you know, this yeah. is how much time we have. Yeah. And, uh, and then like for internal discussions, like I want, I want to, like you said, like I want to build in time to, to know that, you know, we have time to chit chat and get, you know, catch up on what's going on in each other's lives and just not rely on meetings as like the cornerstone for how we get work done, but more yeah. so for like, you know, really hammering things out and like getting a little bit of personal time in. And so we're always going to default to, you're going to hear us say it like a broken record, but like asynchronous communication for remote teams is really I think the only way to go if you're if you have some a tool that's transparent and then also promotes asynchronous communication, you can you can get a lot more done without pulling your hair out. <laughs> and definitely visit our our blog for we have tons of tips on like 
how to integrate this concept of asynchronous communication into remote teams, um, even if you're being um, kind of forced into this remote work setting, like I think it's really important that you are not always responding to messages all the time and, you know, giving everybody time to digest information and respond on their own time, et cetera, et cetera. Totally. <laughs> yeah, that's like the biggest, I think so, something that blows people's minds is the, is the, how important it is when people start working remotely that you can't expect, like you really have to be clear about the expectations for the team. Like don't praise the people that are working all night and early in the mornings. I mean, you set a, you set a standard that everybody ends up having to live up to and it just is crushing. <laughs> totally. uh, um, I guess we've hit 30 minutes already. That went by so fast. <laughs> wow. That was crazy. <laughs> That was fun. We don't actually get a chance to do this very often and just kind of chit chat about some of these things that we're actually like passionate about. So that's uh, this was fun. Um, one thing we wanted to mention is we just announced yesterday uh, via our social media channels that we are doing what we're calling doest office hours. Um, so for anybody out there that wants to have like a little bit of a deeper discussion with uh, one of us at Doist, you can go to one of any of our main social media channels and find the office hours that we have available. You can book a time with one of us. I think there's nine of us that have opened up our calendars to have uh, conversations with you about your biggest remote work challenges. And if you enjoyed this and if you'd like to see more or you have more questions, send them through to the uh, to the uh, channel that you're using to watch this and we will we'll do our best to to get back to you and Maybe do it again sometime. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Hope this was useful for you. Hang in there. Yeah. This is <laughs> for everybody. You're not alone. That's um, very true. And you can always reach out to us. Um, yeah, again, on, on social uh, social media or to our support team for any questions or support, technical or emotional. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're here for you in multiple yes. ways. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thanks, Bruna, for, for starting your day like this. Thanks for ending your day, Chase. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.